So thank you so much, Calvin, for being here with us today. Um, yeah. So for those who don't know you, um, do you want to start out just by kind of introducing yourself and telling us a bit about what you do? Yeah, absolutely. So uh, I'm Kelvin Van Ryn. I'm the founder and president of The Fritter Shop. Uh, the Fritter Shop is a specialty Dutch dessert shop that started way back in my roots. I was actually born and raised in uh, Amsterdam and my parents owned a bakery there. And I'll get into the whole story, but essentially they, they had the bakery there. We immigrated here and we bought, brought one of the Dutch recipes with us and it ended up being a big hit here. I had the idea to expand on that and um, we're seven years into business now. Uh, we started franchising um, and we're currently at five locations and we have our production space in London, Ontario as well. Awesome. I'm super, super interested in the franchising aspect of this because I know this is like a relatively in the last few years, a relatively new addition to the business. And so we will get into that in a few minutes. But first, I want to hear more about the backstory because you've been baking for a really, really long time, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I... I do come from a line of entrepreneurs, um, all, especially on my dad's side. All my uncles, they own their own business and a couple of my aunts as well. Uh, my parents were both business owners and they just happened to be in the bakery business. Um, and so the whole business started in 1989 with my parents taking over an existing bakery in downtown Amsterdam. Uh, it was called Lilma and they took this over and they grew it over the next 12 years and they had a lot of success with it and you know they after running a busy downtown amsterdam bakery for 12 years they thought you know we've kind of we've, we've made our money in that now and it's it's a lot of hard work and a lot of stress and we just want something new and after going on a vacation to canada one year they thought this is our something new so they sold the bakery they sold the business um they sold the house and immigrated me and my brother and uh, and just the four of us, we immigrated to Canada. Um, after a couple of years of, of kind of trying to find what their passion was and what else they wanted to do, they thought, you know what, well, let's just do what we do best. We can't really find anything else. And they started their own little bakery again. They, they didn't want to scale. They didn't want to be a big bakery. Um, they just wanted to just do what they do well and do it on a smaller scale. So they opened up the Dutch Bakery in St. Thomas, and uh, they ran that for many years. Um, I grew up kind of working in this bakery. I have 14, over 14 years of experience working in a bakery now. Um, and just growing up in this bakery and its environment and this entrepreneur life, I thought this is just, I, I'm one of the lucky ones who knew, you know, when I was 15, I knew that I wanted to be an entrepreneur, that I wanted to start my own business. Before then, I already kind of had some things that I was like, okay, maybe, you know, running a business one day is going to make sense, but you're just too young to really think about it. Um, but uh, I'll, the fun little quick side story, when I was, I think I was 11 or 12 in, in the, our backyard, we had a bunch of these plum trees. And um, I thought, well, we have all these plum trees and all these plums. What, what can I do with it? And what I decided to do is set up, like I, I spent all day picking plums and, and I put them in baskets and I set them up. And then in our front little driveway, I tried to sell plums. And um, I learned a tough lesson that day that, you know, just because you have a product doesn't mean people are going to buy it. And there was maybe eight people living on the street and no one even knew I was selling the plums or anything. So uh, I only sold like two baskets and it was to my parents. So, um, but it was, it was just like, just that, that early sign of like, I wanted to, you know, run my own business. Um, so just to get back on track. So, um, I grew up working in this bakery and one year my dad made apple fritters because traditionally you eat apple fritters to celebrate the coming of the new year in Holland. So he made these fritters and, you know, we were just selling them like crazy and people were coming back in January, February, March saying, you know, where's the apple fritters? Where's the apple fritters? And we we're like, oh no, it's just like a, it's a once a year thing. We just do it to celebrate the new year. And, and we just had so much demand for it where, you know, my dad just kind of looked at me and said, why don't we make these all year round? And, you know, that year it became our best selling item. And I was 15 at the time. And I said to my dad, like, this could be a, a business on its own. Like, why don't we take the apple fritter and then do different, sh different flavors? Like we could do a 
strawberry fritter or blueberry fritter. And, you know, he hated the idea. He thought it was, you know, he hated it, hated it. He's like, you know, it, you can do whatever you want, but it doesn't make sense to me. He's like, you can't get like, like apple, the traditional apple fritter is a slice of apple, like a ring of apple with a custard in the middle. And then it's wrapped in a pastry dough. Um, and then that's deep fried. And he's like, you can't do that with a blueberry filling. It's just all going to come out the side and you're going to ruin my oil and yada, yada. And I said, dad, just, just let me try it one time. So, you know, before we were going to clean the fryer one night, I stayed after hours and I just made, I, t- I bought a couple like pie fillings at, um, bulk barn. And I just, you know, had my little cup of, of filling and I, I put them in and I tried it out and I was like, and I fried them and the filling stayed in and they tasted awesome. And I was like, here's my idea, you know, here's my, my opportunity to start a business. Um, but I was 16 at the time. So I, w- I was just too young to really get started, but I had that idea now. And I was like, it works. I can do this. And then um, my parents are very, you know, traditional European um uh, family so they said you know if you want to try it that's great but we need you to have a plan b um so they forced me to get some post-secondary first um and so uh december 2015 i graduated from business marketing at fanshawe and in january 2016 i started what was called kelvin's fritter shop at the time and um i just kind of took the product, went to a couple seasonal markets, you know, I was just working, you know, two days a week or so on my business and then working full time for my dad still, because it just, of course, when you're starting out, it's not enough to, you know, pay, pay your own salary. I did uh, $8,000 in my first year of business and I was pretty proud of myself for that. And, you know, it's definitely, you know, not much and not sustainable, but it was, it was for me enough to keep going with it. So I ran that for a couple of years and then I got some local partnerships with coffee cap, like coffee companies and uh, Western university. I got on their catering menu and um, I just kind of grew the business enough to the point where it was like, okay, we can't operate out of this tiny little baker anymore because I was working out of my dad's bakery still. And what we decided to do at that point was we realized that I was really good at branding. I was really good at, you know, getting the product out there and selling And my dad was really good at just overall running a bakery. So we thought we're going to be a good partner here. Why don't we partner up together? And then my mom took care of all the bookkeeping and everything as well. So the three of us, we partnered up and we started, we took away my dad's branding and we made the fritter shop. And so uh, we, we got a bigger location also in St. Thomas on the main street there. Uh, We, I took over the branding and all of the marketing and all of that. Um, And my dad, and the staff that he already had, we had one or two people working for us at the time. Um, they kind of took over the production. And then I was still, you know, working for the Dutch bakery as well, the Dutch bakery, um, which was, we called the Dutch bakery, the actual production side, and then the fritter shop, the whole branding selling side. Um, so I, I worked with, we worked like that for about two years. After two years time, we realized that we are not good business partners at all. Like we thought, you know, you have that side handled. I have the other side handled. My mom's taking care of all the financials. We're good. Um, But it turns out that the generational gap between what I think is important and what my dad thinks is important was too big. It was causing a lot of fights and a lot of just back and forths. And like, Nicole, I'm telling you, this guy, it took six months to convince him that we needed to get a debit machine because he just he loved cash (laughs) business oh wow okay yeah that is a generational thing yeah right like and um like our boxes i'll show you here we have like our fritter boxes which i think are beautiful and i'm very proud of um but what he sees is we're paying you know 40 cents for a box when we have these unbranded boxes that we could be getting for 10 cents. And he's like, why are you spending so much on packaging? You don't need it. And I was like, no, there's value in having a brand. And, and you know, um, one of the backbones of our business was our farmer's market location at the Western Fair Market. And I was like, there's so many people walking around with our product, but nobody knows. Like, if you're new, you don't really know where it's coming from. And if we have a big pile of boxes that all say the fritter shop and our whole booth is branded nice and and then you see all these customers walking around with fritter shop boxes. I was like, there's value in that. And I couldn't give him the data from if you do this, it gives you this much sales. So, and it's hard to get that kind of data, right? But there is real value in having 
brand awareness and 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 building that brand equity. Um, so there was just a number of things like that that came up where after, you know, this was in year five, the beginning of year five, where we decided, you know what, we can't do this together as much as we want to. It's just causing too much of a wedge in our actual father-son relationship. Um, and that's when the opportunity to open up our production space came around um, here in London. So as I mentioned, we you know already had our booth at the Western Fair Market and the Western Fair District was in the middle of building this, this incubator space, this food production hub. And I caught wind of it and I heard about it and immediately applied and immediately reached out and, you know, just annoyed them until they took my meeting. And um, I just kind of pitched the idea. I said, this is what we're doing. Uh, we're ready to kind of, this was in 2019, by the way. This is what we're doing. We're, we're, our biggest issue is keeping up with production and we need this space. And, and there was some funding that came with the space. And, and I thought this is just a perfect fit for me to get away from my dad, start doing things my own way, and he can have the store in St. Thomas and I can kind of grow the rest. And uh, they ended up approving the application and the game plan was to open for September 2020. As we all know, March 2020 came around and and threw a wrench in some of the plans. Um, so things got delayed a little bit, um, but, you know, we persevered and, and we were open by July 2021 in that production space. And that's when we kind of fully separated me and my dad. Uh, my mom is still involved in both businesses. So the way it's set up now is my dad runs St. Thomas. I run the rest. And my mom is kind of doing the bookkeeping for, for both companies. Um, so we opened up the production space and we got really lucky because in some ways COVID was actually our friend. Um, and one of those ways was um, there were some companies that were, you know, on the verge of going under already um, that COVID just kind of made it easier for them to close up shop. And uh, one of those companies was a larger bakery in um, London. And when they closed up, I kind of went, you know, I, I heard they were closing up and they were auctioning off all their, all their bakery equipment. And there was two pieces of equipment specifically that I was already in the market to, to buy. And, um, you know, I got a tour of the, the space they had and they sh she showed me the two pieces plus a bigger mixer as well that she had. And she's, you know, we just kind of got to talking. I told her our story and, and what I'm doing and why I'm doing it. And, and you know, one of the things that is on your side as, as a young entrepreneur is, is people see a certain passion and drive that maybe they, they saw in themselves at a younger age and they want to help you do that um i've seen it time and time again because i started when i was 22 i'm 29 now um and you know i was i was what was i 26 26 27 uh when i was doing this and i just had this fire and this passion i, I believe i still have um but she just saw that and she's like i want to support you so i got these pieces of equipment for essentially half price because she was just like i'm just ready to retire anyway and covid just kind of was was enough for us to say you know enough is enough and, and we're going to close up shop and um and i, I just want to support you and we were very fortunate with that so we got all of our equipment for a big discount as well which was just fantastic when you're already investing all this time and energy and money into opening up this production space um and the next thing that happened you know as covid was happening as we were opening up our production space we kind of stumbled backwards into um franchising so we covid hits and we're at a bit of a panic you know we, we end up closing up for two weeks because no one knows what's going on and, and uh, it's all just so new and and confusing and we don't know how bad it's going to be and and what it looks like and um we closed up for two weeks and during those two weeks a uh local restaurant that was you know most of their income is based off of university students that weren't coming anymore uh so so they messaged me during those two weeks and they say you know like we're a little worried about all of this um so we're just looking to diversify a bit and and add more to our product line and I said, sure, let's have a conversation. Um, so I go there and and sit down and, and they say, you know, tell us about 
what your franchising plan looks like. I was like, franchising plan? I was like, no idea. I was like, I was thinking I could just sell you some fritters at a wholesale price and, and you resell them. Um, of course I didn't say that. And I was like, oh yeah, franchising. Like, yeah, we, we've been thinking about it, but you know, it's, you know, fake it till you make it kind of thing. Um, so I just, I say to them, you know, let me, I, I, I thought this was going to be more of a wholesale plan. Um, let me just get my, a few things together and I'll, you know, I'll present you the plan in a couple of weeks. And, you know, I, I came to them, of course, brought freighters with me. Uh, put together this plan and said, you know, this is kind of going to be what it would look like if you're interested. This is your initial investment. Uh, this is how long I think it would take for you for you to get your money back. Um, and these are the strategies that we need you to implement to sell these things. And they said, yeah, sounds good. So immediately contact my lawyer or, or find a lawyer who's in the franchising world and and contact them and say, you know what, what does it look like to, to set this up? And he's like, well, you need your franchise disclosure documents and that's very expensive and it's going to take a lot of time, um, but we can do it. And I was like, okay, well, you know, we'll try that for now and, or, or we'll work on that. But for now we'll get like just a licensing agreement set up. And, and that's kind of how it all started. And just from setting that up, it took about six months to fully set that up. And then we set that up. And then just from telling my customer base, at the market and other locations that we were selling at, um, like just seasonal markets and things. I was just telling my customers like, yeah, we're, we're uh, pivoting into franchising now with COVID happening. And, and, you know, during that first year of COVID, it was a lot of outdoor events that were still like uh, happening, you know, later on in the year. And just from telling my customers this, they, you know, we opened up two other locations, one in Strathroy and one in Hamilton. Um, of just people being like, I could see, I see why you're franchising and, and this is simple enough. And um, yeah, so that's kind of how we grew. And um, now we've figured out, there's a lot of speed bumps we kind of ran into as, as we pivoted into franchising, especially having no idea what this even looks like. You know, um, I, before that I had all the help of my parents who had run businesses before but never a franchise system. So to set up that whole franchise system, you know, is it, it was fairly expensive and frustrating at times and tough to let somebody else represent your product. And there was a lot of learnings that came with that. But, uh, you know, I feel like we have, we have a better grasp on things now. And we just recently partnered with uh, cadence franchising, which is a franchising company that's represents a lot of larger clients mcdonald's being one of them um and the people who own it they've worked with beaver tails and they've been pretty crucial to Cobb's bread uh growing the way they have so i'm really excited to to have partnered with them and we found a franchise lawyer that has a bunch of i think he said 20 years with with uh tim hortons and 10 years with mcdonald's as well um so I've just started to surround myself with people who know what they're talking about. And then I'm just kind of trying to be a sponge off of that. Um, so, and that's kind of where we are today. So, um, you know, we're, we're also last piece of the puzzle is we're also um, buying a food truck, which should be operational by April. And we're going to be pivoting into franchising the food trucks as well. And there's a number of reasons for that, but we can kind of unpack that a bit as we talk. Uh, cause I feel like I've been telling my story for a long time now. Yeah, no, no, that's great. <laughs> Honestly, I love it when I have people come on to the show and they, they tell the whole story, right? Cause you get to yeah. see that behind the scenes piece that I think a lot of people don't really see when you're outside of it, that you have to pivot so much, right? Like it sounds like every step of the game, it was just like pivot, 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 like make yep. a change figure out what you're doing and like move it forward. Right. Which yeah. is, it's not easy. It's not easy to do. It's um, never a straight line of it. It just goes like that. Right. It's there's, there's a hundred ideas I've had that were just wildly unsuccessful. You know, one of them yeah. was when COVID first hit, we thought, okay, well, why don't we start doing deliveries and we'll just deliver direct to consumer. And it sounds nice. And I was like, you know, a couple of my friends, they, they couldn't go to work either. And I was like, I can just pay you guys cash to do these deliveries for me. And, and they were all on board. And then I realized very quickly how much you just turn into a logistics transportation company rather than a fritter selling company. And I hated that. Like, it was just not my forte. 
Uh, yeah. I, I, and then that's the thing, right? You have to figure it out as you go along and see what pieces of the puzzle you actually enjoy doing, what pieces of the puzzle work, what pieces yeah. of the puzzle you hate, right? Because there are, there are certain things. Like I've talked um, pretty extensively about this on the podcast that like running a manufacturing facility was not my jam. Like that was not something that I was into. And like, if I were to do it again, that's not something that I would choose to do, right? But plenty of people like yourself included, I'm sure enjoy that piece of, of having a food business, right? I won't lie to you, Nicole. The food production is my favorite part of the business. It's like, your, that's, are you kidding? I'm not. I love food production. Like I just, I, I, we've also just, figured out a system that really works and just creating more efficiencies and, and doing all the timing of how long each task takes and what do we need to automate next? And I, I really love that part of it. Uh, yeah. Wow. Okay. Okay. Yeah. I love, I love that you love that. It, I mean, it means you're in the <laughs> right industry, right? Like right? <laughs> the, the space for you to be in. Um, yeah. Okay. Yeah. So I do want to go back to um, the franchising stuff because I have yeah. so many questions about this. And I actually have um, a couple of clients right now that are looking at moving in this direction with their business and doing more of a franchise model as well. And then they come yeah. and talk to me about it. And I'm like, I don't know. I don't know anything about franchising. So yeah. I'd love to learn from you on this. Um, sure. When you started out with that first restaurant, so you started out with them and what made you make the decision to continue to move in that direction? Did you find that it just worked really, really well as a business model? Um, were you getting a lot of great feedback on it or did it kind of just the ball started rolling organically and it just kind of happened? Yeah, so they it did all happen organically. And when it first came my way, I thought, oh my God, somebody else wants to invest their money into putting my brand in, uh, in a popular area, especially it was right by Western University or is right by Western University. I thought this is a no brainer. Let's do it. And I quickly learned it's it's so hard to have somebody else represent your your business. And for me, especially one of my struggles was I was just a young kid um, who was still learning about the food industry. And, you know, I, I know what my parents have taught me, but you know, then I'm dealing with somebody like the owner, he's in his fifties and he has, you know, 30 years in experience in the food industry. And, and I'm telling him like, this is how we need to sell the product. Like, like one of the big hurdles in the, for us has always been the product is better when it's made fresh in a deep fryer, but it takes seven minutes to deep fry it. Um, and not everybody has the ventilation, fire suppression, like all this. And that's very expensive. So that's a, it was a big hurdle for us to get over. And even though Bearcat, who is the company that, that, you know, we partnered up with, they had all of that. They didn't necessarily have the room to add another fryer because you can't fry this, the fr like French fries and fritters in the same oil it just doesn't work. So then I had him telling me, Oh no, we just do this. And, you know, we, we had done a process before where we re-thermalize the fritters in an oven. Um, and he's like, I have this oven that will work. And, um, it's a very expensive oven so it can do whatever you need. And we played with the settings and, um, like it's just, I had someone telling me how I should be running my business. And without that franchise disclosure document saying you have like franchisees have very little control, it's their business and they have to you know, run it and, and do all the work, but they, the franchisor has 90% of the control of what's going. If, if there's an update or renovation that needs to happen, they just tell you, you need to do this. And, you know, it's coming out of your pocket. You have to pay for it. Um, however, the product's being made, they have to follow every step to a T. The training is all, it's all given to you. You have a turnkey model, you know, with majority of these franchises, you have a turnkey model. That's like, you do this, you do A, B, and C, and you'll get D. You know, it's, it's, it's all da data driven and that's great, but I didn't have that control as the franchisor in the beginning. And especially cause it was just a licensee agreement. Um, so that like, there were so many struggles I learned with that, but it wasn't a deterring factor for me. It was a learning. It wasn't ever, it was like, okay, this isn't working and this is frustrating. And I have somebody else representing the brand and I didn't train them enough. And 
they don't know enough about the process and they change the process and I don't like this. And that all happened. But it for me, it was just like, okay, well, I knew things were going to be bad because we were getting into franchising without knowing anything or even having contacts who knew anything. Um, I did do like a franchise school kind of thing uh, uh, with uh, Marietta. Oh, I'm blanking on her last name or in the company name. Anyways, I'll, I'll, I'll figure that out. Uh, but yeah, it was, it was great. It was just a good introductory. This is what franchising looks like and this is what you need to do. Uh, but I am just such a hands-on learner. Like I learn by doing, I, I don't learn by, you know, reading. And um, I had the same thing with, with uh, graduating from the marketing program. I learned so much, but also it felt more like terminology. I learned and more of just colloquial language rather than how do I, how do I, you know, market a business or, or run a business. Um, so yeah, that, that was kind of it for me. It was, it was, we did it and it was, exciting to have somebody else represent the brand they, they have like a big led uh tv screen uh right outside of there and and we got our logo up on there so like every time i drove by i would see a big fritter shop logo on. it was it was all really exciting for me in the beginning um uh, but then it kind of hits you that you need more control and um and we try we've now really you know isolated all of the th all of the issues that we ran into and, and and fix that and i feel moving forward very comfortable about you know what franchise needs to, need to do and what our training process looks like and and getting them operational and and giving them all the data points and saying you know if you do a b and c you get d um but it definitely took a lot of learning yeah i mean it sounds like a massive process to go well, through right yeah. to try and figure out okay this not that it didn't work but it, some aspects of it didn't work right mm -hmm. and so like why is that and how can we change it and how can we again like the pivoting and moving forward right yeah so yeah. how did you then figure that out like how did you regain that control to convince a franchise owner to go out and purchase like equipment that they maybe didn't have in the past, like another deep fryer or the ventilation hood. Um, and to be able to, like, it's one thing to give them a set of guidelines to follow, but to be able to know that they actually are following those guidelines, like how do you manage those challenges? So you have, you just have to go check in on them. Don't let them know you're coming and just kind of drop by sometime. And, and, you know, right now, with the locations we have, we have three corporate locations and, and two franchise locations. Um, one of them we had to close down for a number of reasons, but you know, we, it was a good learning again to go through that process. Um, but to get that control, you just, it's all in the franchise disclosure document. So, you know, in there too, it says, these are the rules. If you don't like it, or if we catch you three times, of you know not following the rules or, or there's like in our disclosure document as well there's like absolute deal breakers and if you break these rules you're out um so we just got them i just went to them and said listen what we're doing isn't working and if numbers don't lie so we just you know reviewed the numbers together and said you know this isn't working and i think it's because a b and c and i was like i need we need to invest a little bit more and get the process better. I showed him the numbers that I was doing at, at my locations and, and comparing it to him and, and saying, you know, the, there's a real gap here. And, you know, we, we knew going into this, I was very transparent that I wasn't a franchise system before, um, before we partnered with him. And I said, you know, it just has to look like this. And when you approach somebody with, you know, you have to spend more money. Uh, it was it was very uncomfortable, absolutely. But as long as you do your homework and you say, you say, you know, the, the I know what this location should be doing. I know how many people are in the area. I know how many students are here. How many people are entering your business itself? Because that's an interesting like micro franchise aspect of of our franchise system is we have these kiosk models, and that's what Barricad is. Um, I know how many people are coming into your store and it sh there should be more customers being converted um, and they're not. And, you know, I think it's because of all these reasons. And um, once I kind of put it that way and I said, you know, this is how much you need to invest. And I think it would, it would make this much of a difference. Um, it was a little bit easier to convince them, but it's still, I'm, 
the way I was viewed is still like, I'm the young entrepreneur trying to figure it out. And he's the experienced, um, owner who, who, who knows, you know, and, um, but you know, I, I can be very convincing. So, uh, we just had that talk and said, you know, I think, I think this would really make a difference. And, and at the end of the day, we came to an agreement and, um, yeah, it, it ended up working. So he's still operational now. And, and I'm really thankful for that. Um, and yeah, so it's, it's, it's never comfortable, but if you do your homework, do your due diligence and, Data drives everything, you know, it, it, everything is backed by data and it, it's a realization I wish I had sooner, you know, just numbers don't lie and follow the numbers and that'll tell you exactly what needs to happen. Um, for us, a great example of this is a sampling program. So we figured out that we do really well at, at destination places. That's why we do so well at the Western Fair Farmers Market. We do well wherever there, there's people. And then when we opened a new, new location, we also realized that there's a real educational curve to get around with fritters because people hear fritter or apple fritter and they think of Tim Horton's donut style fritter or, yeah. you know, there, there's a lot of places that make the donut style fritter. And um, our fritters are the traditional Dutch fritters and they look nothing like that. You know, they they don't have the glaze. They don't have any of that. They have the sugar on the outside and and a, like a real apple on the inside. Um, and they taste way better. I, and yes, of course, I'm biased and I'm going to think that, but I'm glad you said it too. They, they're really like filled with stuff. And that yeah. I think is like the key. Th and anybody who loves a filling is going to love these. Yeah, yeah. The, the way I always describe it to people who have never even seen or heard of the product is it is a, a very gourmet version of a toaster strudel, right? Like it's just, yeah. it's a, it's closer to a toaster strudel than, you know, your, your apple fritter from Tim Hortons. Um, but people don't know that. And what we figured out is that just sampling the product, because I've always been confident in our, in our product's quality. And um, it's, it's just about educating our customer about what the product is. And I call it uh, food to mouth marketing. We just get people to eat the product and it, it kind of sells itself. And then we started collecting data on that. So, what we do is when we open up a new location, we have our grand opening and we give away X amount of fritters and yada, yada. But we also have a sampling program where every customer that comes into the store, we have warm fritters ready to go, um, but they're cut in, in sixth. And then every time a customer comes in, is like, oh, I haven't had that product before. We give them a sample and then one in three people end up buying a fritter from that. So if we're already at these destination places where there's already a bunch of people coming, we convert one in three people who we can get to try a sample. So then we say, okay, you want to open up a location? We know that the, you know, the population is 150,000 people in, in this geographic area. That's your territory. We want you to set up here. Um, there's this amount of people walking by the street and we want you to be sampling because every third person that tries a sample is going to come buy something for you. Um, so it's actually a marketing program that's profitable. It, it, it doesn't cost anything. It only brings in more sales. Um, so that kind of data is, is what you need to really be able to back up what you're saying and, and what claims you're making. Um, so yeah, a little tangent about, about what data means, but it's, it's everything for a business, uh, yeah. especially a franchise business. Well, and sampling too is so key in a food business. It's so key. I remember being at um, CanFit, CanFit Pro, because uh, I was in the health food space. And so I'm at yeah. this, it's like a three-day trade show in Toronto. And we brought the amount of samples that we thought we needed and ran out within the first like few hours because we wow. had no, we had no idea. And the second we ran out of samples, literally nobody was walking up to our booth mm -hmm. and we were like, do you want, do you want to buy an energy bar? And people are like, can I try a sample first? Oh no, we don't have any samples. And people would literally just walk away. And so yeah. thankfully, um, one of my team members was in London coming to Toronto for the weekend. And she was like, do you want me to bring you more samples? And I was like, please, please do. <laughs> I need more yeah. samples. And she did. And it was a game changer. Like people started coming back to the booth again. So like anybody who's in the food industry, I think a lot of us hesitate to sample the product at first because you think immediately about the cost of doing it. 
but mm -hmm. you're absolutely right. It's a marketing program that makes you money because you're going to yeah. put out the cost of sampling it initially, but it will always sell. It'll, it'll always convert. Exactly. Exactly. And if you don't have that, that trust yet from people like people, you know, don't see your brand and know who you are. You don't, you haven't built that trust yet. It's, it's hard to get them to just make that purchase, but if they can try the product and if, if, you know, you have a great product, it's, it does the work for you. And, and it's a lot easier to start that conversation. Like, Oh, you haven't had a fritter before. Like, it, Oh, we do a whole different style here, try it. And then let me tell you a little bit about it. And um, it's, it's a much easier way to get the conversation started as well. I find so. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. Yeah. Um, now I wanted to come back to this conversation around cadence. Cause that's a really cool thing that has just happened in your business. Yeah. Did you meet them at, you went to the Canadian Franchise Association show, is that right? Yes, that's right. Um, I didn't meet them there. They're actually the ones who got me in with the CFA. Um, I met them through, so there's there's currently four, five shareholders in the company, uh, me being one of them, my mom being the other, and then uh, Marty is someone I've been working with for a while now, and he also is now into the company um he's he's i've been working with the guy for four years now and he's just shown me time and time again how much he cares about the brand and the business and it was through marty that i actually met uh Corey and cindy who are the owners of cadence and um they've just been they just have this wealth of knowledge of just no this is we know the franchising world like you know they've been in it for 20 plus years and and they know what it takes to build a successful franchise and marty introduced us I, I gave him a tour of the production space gave him the you know some some of the product they loved the branding they loved the story they said you know you have something that's that's you know it, it has potential and and they saw the potential in me and they saw the potential in the business and they decided to uh to work with us and you know they're they're not exactly in our budget uh but luckily i was you know they're they're able to to work with me and, and, and find something that worked for both of us. And yeah, so really excited about them and just, it's, it's so nice to, to have some sort of mentorship as well in the franchising world uh, because it's just, it's a whole different world of business and it's, there's so much that you don't know that if you don't have that kind of support, it, it can be a little overwhelming. And that's kind of what I experienced for the first couple of years in franchising um, so yeah, we signed with Cadence in, uh, on January 2nd, 2023 and, uh, haven't looked back. Oh, me, that's amazing. Congratulations, man. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Really exciting. Uh, so what exactly do they help with? Like, what is their role? So they pretty much like help us get all of the leads and then they nurture those leads and make sure they the, the leads are qualified. But on top of that, they're giving us all this support in terms of, like they have all the connections in the CFA, they're board members of the CFA. Um, they got us our booth for free actually at the CFA, which was just fantastic. Um, it gets us that exposure, their network. Um, we were so busy at the show at one point that they, you know, they have no requirement to help us in the booth at all. But they saw me and Marty just selling and talking to people. And we both just had a lineup of people and they actually came and worked in the booth with us. And then there was like four lines of like people trying to talk to us. And it was, it was a great experience. Um, so they, they just, you know, take all the leads, find leads for us, uh, nurture those leads and then qualify them to a certain point. Once they're qualified enough and they sign that franchise application, then they get sent to um, our, our VP of, of franchising and then, you know, qualify them further. And so they are just, they have a system that just nurtures leads and continuously brings in leads. And they have, you know, CRM systems, the customer relationship management. Um, they have all of that, that, you know, is, is just a huge service to us. And it takes so much of the responsibility of finding qualified applicants off my plate, um, which is just great. But their work is fantastic, but their network is phenomenal. You know, it's, it's, yeah. So that's, that's a huge help as well. That's yeah, absolutely. It's all in who, you know, right. 
the network is, I feel like so invaluable and you don't necessarily realize that getting in, but as you start to partner with people who have an extensive network in mm -hmm. the area or in the category that you're in, it can, it can help you with exponential growth. Right. So this is huge for you. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and just, it's, it's just so nice to be working with somebody now who's been there, done that, you know? Yeah. It's like, I, I run into this thing. It's like, I have no idea what to do. And like, oh, no, no, no problem. Like, you know, you just do this, this and this and it, and it's figured out, you know? So oh. it just that part is really nice too. It's that just huge mental I'll do the work. Yeah. I'll, I'll do the work. I'm not afraid of that. It's just sometimes not knowing. And then especially in franchising, you have your business and, you know, you think you can franchise it. So you start to do it, but What's very real and gets real very quickly is that you're asking people to invest their, you know, potential life savings or their money, their their own hard for, hard earned money into your idea. So you better make sure that what you're doing is going to be profitable for them because, you know, it, it's it's a lot more than just risking your own um, your own yeah money or your own you know well-being yeah. it's, it's other people's other livelihoods so exactly so yeah. there, there's a real responsibility that comes with it as well and it's not something that i take lightly and it's you know i really do believe in in our our business our our franchise system our products and that that kind of gives me the confidence to do this but to just have answers for for questions that come up now too is is really nice like just more of a freeing and relieving feeling for me as well. Right. Yeah. It takes a bit of a mental burden. I feel like off of yeah. your shoulders when you have someone there that can just guide you a little bit. Right. Yeah. 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 So all of that, you're doing all of this. And I could see that this is probably going to lead to pretty like quick growth for your, the franchise side of your business, which is yeah. fantastic. Yeah. And you're also going to tackle this food truck thing. So tell us more about that. Okay. So yeah, the food truck, um, the re reason we did the food truck is because again, data, it showed us that events and markets is where we're making our money. Um, a brick and mortar location is, is fine, but there's so much overhead and the labor costs are high and it, we're paying money to market, to try and bring people to us. And, you know, one day it just kind of clicked for us that actually, to be completely honest, it was my manager who said, you know, my manager at the production space, she's like, we need to do a food truck. Why aren't you doing a food truck? And I, and I kind of brushed it off at first. I was like, no, we have our system with the markets and stuff. It works and we're doing our events. And, and later it clicked um, that with a food truck, we can just go to the people. We can go to these events. And again, our data showed that when we go to an event on average between about four and a half, between four to five percent of people who attend these events are our customers. So we can do the math of say, OK, there's an event happening and, you know, 50,000 people are coming. Well, four to five percent of those people are going to be our customers. And our, you know, our average sale right now is about thirteen dollars. So we know that X amount of people are probably going to buy around four. 13 14 dollars worth of product so we can kind of make a projection about how much money we sh we could be making at these events and then we start looking at it with a food truck and we you know through the franchise and everything too we learned that it's not just we ha we have to deep fry our product fresh like we tried the oven thing and it's just there's a certain theater and like to to frying the fritters fresh and the smells in the air and they're nice and hot when they come out and it, that's so important to our business. And that's what sets us aside from all these other specialty donut shops is they have to make all their product early in the morning and then just kind of sell it throughout the day where we're making everything fresh. Every seven minutes, there's a fresh batch coming out. And we realized that's, that's a big selling point for us. So we want to keep that as a core part of the business. And another way we found this out is, you know, it's as simple as asking your customers. We started doing surveys. We started just asking people, hey, what do you like about us? And the words that kept coming up were fresh, the smell, taste, things like that. We're like, okay, well, we need to keep that as core aspects of our business. Um, so we just realized, okay, well, events and markets is where we're making our money. What we hate about events and markets is lugging everything there. And like I had a turbo yes. oven at one point and like you, you have to set up your tent and you need you know a certain skill set 
or, or strength to be able to do that. And, you know, I'm the tallest guy there. So I had to like lift her. I always had to be there. And, and then we thought, you know, okay, the food truck takes care of everything. Instead of waking up at, you know, three in the morning and frying until seven in the morning and then leaving and setting up by 8 a.m., we could just show up at 6.30 in the morning and turn on the fryers and we're we're open. We're ready to go. There's no setup. There's no nothing. Um, so I just love that idea. And then I started talking to other food truck owners and seeing what they're doing and what works for them. And, and then I heard a, a, a lot about corporate catering and weddings and private events. And they're like, you don't pay rent. You don't pay any, you have your minimum order. You show up, you know, you have a three hour window that you're just there. You're making the product and you can do two or three of those in a day, especially with us. You know, we can just show for a two hour window and, and do that three times a day. And you just have your minimum order of X amount of dollars and say, we'll show up and we'll bake it and whatever. And then you don't pay rent, you don't pay anything. And it's very predictable how much uh, work is going to be there, how much staff you need. Um, and it, it's just, it's way more simple, but you're still providing a really, you're providing the same great product and the process and the experience and the theater I've talked about. Um, and you're kind of doing that food to mouth marketing piece on somebody else's dime. Like, especially if you're doing corporate catering or, or weddings or something, you're, you're showing up there, the product's all paid for. So you'll just give it to whoever comes up and, and ask for it. Right. Um, and you're just getting your, it's a great way to get your product out there. Um, so the more we started thinking about the food truck and seeing what ways we can kind of find new streams of revenue, the more we thought this is a slam dunk. Like this makes so much sense for our business model. Um, so yeah, we're opening that up in, in April and we're also, we added that to our franchise system as well. Um, the the food truck model because it just it's it's very predictable and it it it's very low cost to get into so yeah i just think that's brilliant honestly like i think that's a brilliant kind of way to follow the numbers and follow the metrics and follow like what your customers are telling you they want yeah also a quick side note when you mentioned going to events and like having to lug everything in and lug everything out and setting up the tent do you remember helping me set up my tent at the Western University Market? Oh yeah, oh yeah. Oh my gosh, that was like those how things. Met. Yes, it is. Yeah, yeah. I remember <laughs> trying your fritters and just being like blown away by how good they were and and how big of a line you had. Like consistently, you always had people that were lined up, like ready to buy fritters from you. Um, and so I, I really remember that, but. Yeah, you're right. Those tents are something else to try and get up oh, on your own, yeah. right? Yeah, yeah. It's it's just such a pain in the butt. And, you know, it's worth it. And I, I still see it making sense that if the food truck's booked for this event and there's another event that would be beneficial to, for us, then we, we can still do it. It's just why go through that struggle every single week if you can just make a small, a small, you, you can make an investment in a food truck and, and you know, just go drive set up and you're you're giving a better product because the other thing is like we always need oil fryers power all of that to be able to give the right experience and and that's all going to be in one unit now um so it's it's yeah it's something i'm really excited about and i think it just makes a lot of sense for for our business um and yeah i guess i we'll see if I'm right, but I, I uh, like to think that we have enough numbers and metrics to say that this is probably our best bet. Yeah. And I love, I love that you're doing exactly that, that you're following the numbers and you're following the metrics, because I think this is something that so many of us miss in the early days is like actually looking at it and doing those calculations. Like when yeah. you were saying, you know, if I know that 50,000 people are coming to this event and I know that we're converting about four to 5%, then this is what the return on the investment is going to look like. Like yeah. nobody runs those calculations in the early days. You're just like picking and you're like, I think yeah. that this is going to be a good event. I think I'm going to just try and go to this event. Or mm -hmm. you might say, oh, this one looks a little too expensive. So I think I'm not going to go to that event. Right, right. But nobody's running the numbers. And it's such a like, like you're saying, it's such a predictable way to be able to say, like, we're going to make our money back on this plus X amount of dollars, it's going to be worth it for us to do this, right? 
Yeah. But you, I think, especially the first couple of years, you need to just not blindly, but kind of you're going into it kind of blindly of just saying, okay, well, we're going to try this and we're going to try that. And, and it, I think the, the important thing is, and I wish I did it five years earlier was just collecting the data on those, making sure you're following up with the event manager and say, you know, can I get the foot traffic numbers? How many people did actually end up showing up and, and looking at your sales and how many customers did I actually end up having? And did I do something different this time um, than the year before? And if I did, how did that impact my sales this year? And like collecting all that data over a two, three year period will give you the answers afterwards and saying, okay, we know that if we do this, this will happen. And that is so important in business is just to like be able to forecast that kind of stuff. And you can forecast what kind of growth you're looking at. And if you want to make an uh, investment, like what we're doing with our food truck, we're making the investment, but we know that, you know, in this amount of months, it's going to be paid back because we're doing X, Y, and Z. Yeah. So yeah, I think you need to have those years where you're just like, okay, well, we're just going to do it and we'll see. But yeah. what I wish I did earlier was, do that, but then also afterwards have a debrief and say, okay, this is everything that happened. Whenever we do an event now, we have our we have our pre-event sheet, we have our post-event sheet. And pre-event, we just kind of say what we think is going to happen. Post-event, we say what actually happened. And then we measure the two and see how good our predictions were and then make any adjustments as we go. And yeah, just, I, I love data now. Like data is, it runs everything, right? For sure. It's so funny because it seems like such a, like almost boring or mundane topic, but it's so integral to running your business, right? Yeah, yeah absolutely. Okay. Yeah. Well, um, Kelvin, this has been awesome. Um, I want to thank you for being on the show and providing so much of your wisdom and your advice um, to our listeners. So if people want to get in touch with you, if they want to follow you, if they want to buy some fritters, which I'm telling you guys right now, you do definitely want to buy some fritters. Um, where can they reach out to you? Yeah. So um, you can reach me personally. If you have any questions about entrepreneurship or anything, I love helping people. I, I love people who are you know crazy enough to try being an entrepreneur. Uh, so you can reach me at Kelvin at the fritter shop.com. Kelvin spelled K E L V I N. Um, if you want to try some fritters, um, you know, we're at the market every Saturday, Sunday at the Western fair farmers market. Uh, you can follow us on Instagram and Facebook, uh, at fritter shop or facebook.com slash the fritter shop. And we'll definitely be posting on there where the food truck's going to be set up. Uh, if you're in the London area, you know, I, I hope that, you know, the food truck's going to be everywhere and, and you'll just see us at some point. So definitely come check us out. Um, and other than that, I, um, if we have any listeners outside of London, I'm, I'm hoping that the franchising system works and, and uh, we'll be opening up somewhere near you soon. Awesome. Well, thank you again so much, Kelvin, for sharing your time with us. I really appreciate it. And uh, I'm really excited to see what's in store for you next. Awesome. Thank you so much for having me, Nicole. It was, it was awesome catching up with you.